fascinated them It's wonderful Long ago and far away Isn't it a pity Shall we dance How long has this been going on Richard Spate Jr., my good friend, is an actor, director, screenwriter, and producer who's known for a variety of roles, including CBS TV series Jericho, The Agency, and the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. Also, you may know him in the recurring role of Archangel Gabriel in the WBCW series Supernatural. It is my pleasure, and it has been way too long. Richard, man, what is going on? Way too long. Dude, it, for starters, let's talk about the time frame, because it's been it's been a crazy amount of time since we've even cyber seen each other. <laughs> like, I remember a time when we lived in the same town, we used to cross paths, and now you're off being a big Vegas star, and, you know, I've uh, moved to the woods of Oregon, and, you know, poof, we, we never crossed paths. So it's I good mean, to see you. It's good to see you too, man. It literally, it literally has been way too long. And of course, we saw our, our mutual friend. Uh, I saw our mutual friend, uh, Audrey Matos. And uh, I don't know if your ears were burning, but we were talking about you. Uh, and we were talking about our, our good times. It's, it's always cool to reflect uh. on those good times. We, we met on uh, a film. Three Blind mm -hmm. Saints. You you were the the lead guy, and you were the the preacher, and we were the you know, Stelio uh, Savante. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were like the three amigos hanging out, man. It was so much fun, man. Yeah. I, I had seen your work, but I had never met you in person, and that was so much fun. Oh, it was so fun, and you know that was one of those. I, I think you were similar to me in that we didn't really exactly know what we were going to do. <laughs> you know, it was like uh, very little information going into that project, but it, what a great group of people yeah. and what a cool town. I mean, you get a different experience when you're doing something in your and you're going home at night. But it's, but we're, when you're all in a hotel and yeah. you're all, you know, kind of on the road together like a band, it gives you a very different experience. And I thought uh, I thought one of the benefits of doing that film was being in, in Lee's Summit, Missouri, that charming little town. Lee um, Summit, Missouri. Yeah. And remember those stories? Yeah. You, we had some really cool, uh, maybe I think you did even uh, more than uh, Stelio and I with uh, Barry Corbin. You you had some. Oh, dude. <laughs> the Barry Corbin's Barry a Corbin. legend. <laughs> Here's the thing. Barry Corbin's a legend. Anybody right now listening to your podcast going, Bar Barry Corbin? Pause. Pull the yeah. car over. Google Barry Corbin and you'll go, oh, that guy. Yeah. Because he's been in movies since the 50s. Yep. And I think he won an Emmy for Northern Exposure, but I know he got nominated for Northern Exposure, which is a show from the from the 80s and 90s. He's just a and he's just a journeyman yes. actor and hardcore Texan. I mean, he is he's not putting on an accent. He's a real deal. He's the real deal. Because uh, on set, he was that cowboy hat and the cowboy boots, that was like that was those were his. Like he had his him. own gear. Yeah, man. Yeah. He did. And that mofo can put away the beers. And great man. <laughs> but like, and I, can I remember one night you and I joined him in his hotel room just to hear stories. And, and I woke you up or I called you. I got you out of your room because you're like, oh, I'm cold tonight. I'm like, no, you're not. And Barry Corbin <laughs> wants us to come to his room. And we're going to Barry Corbin's room because he's a legend. And he's a wild man. Yeah, and we got down there, and and he'd already he'd already you know he'd already been chatting with Bud Weiser before we got there, <laughs> and so he was just animated and telling these stories, and they were just so great, and and it it was great because, you know, you and I had a couple pints, and and it kind of enabled me to ask a couple of fanboy questions, and I probably wouldn't have asked yeah. on set, you know, when he's trying to get his work done or whatever. Um, about like war games and and just you know about his overall arc as an actor again if you don't know what i'm talking about you gotta you gotta look this dude up and you you know watch war games watch the old matthew broderick uh john um 
Adam movie, War Games, and watch him just go to town. He's so good. He's just such an interesting dude. Yeah. And he's had such an interesting storied career. Yeah. Um, and he's a character. Like, I guess that's the thing. When you, when you watch these actors growing up and you are fond of their work and you hope they're cool, you know, you don't know. And because not everybody is. And then you finally meet them and you're like, oh, not only are you cool, but you're like a cartoon version of what I thought you were going to be like. Uh, you're larger than life and, yeah. and jovial and fun. He was just a good dude. Yeah. Really, really fun guy. And how cool was it to watch him work? I mean, like the way, like he was just so on it. Like you could just tell you're on a guy who's done this for a very long time. Just A million natural, times, yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. He, I mean, because I know he wasn't sitting at home last, every night studying his lines. <laughs> right. But every day on set, like, it was spot on. Spot you know, he knew on. what he was doing. Yeah. Knew what he wanted to do. Um, I, I thought that guy was just a, a real crack up and a, and a real, a real treat. Yeah. Um, because I think, you know, the leading guys get all the accolades in Hollywood, but they're Hollywood is built on the back of the character actors, the journeymen and women who've been doing it sort of, behind, I don't want to say behind the scenes cause they're on camera, but you, it's not a Barry Corbin movie. Like you don't go away going. Oh my God! I'm gonna put a Barry Corbin poster in my house. You yeah, know, like you, you, they are the they are the people who make everybody else look awesome because they're so good at what they do. Yeah, that you the whole industry is built on a foundation of those men and women who are you yeah. know so solid and so reliable as performers and good people. Well, that's why you know I'm so glad that you you highlight that because that's one of the reasons why you know I wanted to do this uh, podcast vidcast. It's because a lot of the people who I'm most, uh, you know, closest to in the industry are people like that. You know what I mean? People who are uh, have been doing this a long time, who will be doing this for the next 20, 30 years, and who are the right. backbone in the industry. And I find like it's like I wouldn't want to, you know, not that I wouldn't want to have like a, a an, uh, you know, I would interview an A-lister, but I'm more excited to be honest with you with uh talking to and interviewing the working the working performer because i think that's what people uh i I think that's more intriguing it's more intriguing to me i think i think that's a part of the industry a lot of people don't really uh know about the the day-to-day of the people who are working uh and making uh and and making a a long career of things How, how are you doing right now you you are in uh oregon i am so yeah I, we don't, I don't live in Oregon. I live in Los Angeles, but yeah. you wouldn't know that from this summer because, uh, you know, my wife's from Oregon. She's from one of my favorite places on the planet, this tiny little town called Joseph, Oregon, in the northeast corner of the state. And earlier, uh, you guys were talking about the fires in Portland. We're way, we're five hours drive from Portland. So mm. we get the smoke, but we don't have the fire Good. right now, knock on wood. Um, but it's a super charming little town, and you know the boys had online school. I have three sons, and the boys have online school because they got booted from their normal school because of COVID. And, and when school finished in June, you, you know we're we're kind of looking at our options. Our options are stay home, which you know we're we're blessed to have a home, and you know we're certainly that's fine. We can do that like everybody else. We can buckle down and 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 do that, and did during the whole. Uh, time when the boys were in school but but after school you know we looked at each other and said we got this option to go to escape to get up to oregon where it's you know it's it's a town of 800 people it's at the end of a highway so it's not a pass through town you got to go there and then when you're done you you turn and go away like it's that kind of place and her in-laws are here or sorry my in-laws her parents are here and her sister and my brother-in-law are here with their two kids when we came here originally, also her cousin was here and his kids. And it so everybody sort of converged on this town. Mm-hmm. And we did a two week lockdown in a cabin because I didn't want to show up and kill grandma and grandpa, you know, so we, we didn't want to be accidental carriers here yeah. and bring it in from the big city. So we came up and went to a cabin, locked down for two weeks, masked up, and then slowly matriculated into the community. And now it's like we're locking down with a small town. 
Mm. Uh, and the boys can run amok in the lake and the woods. And, and it's just a way better, more freeing experience for them mm -hmm. than being stuck in our yard, which again, first world problem, but we could have pulled that off. But this is, you know, we had the benefit of having family around us. We got no family in LA right. and nature. Uh, so it was kind of a no brainer and it's been great. The boys like it's so much better for their psyche yeah, to be able to run and be out. They're already stuck on screens all day because mm -hmm. school is on screens all day long, mm -hmm. which is not what my preference for my children would be. I don't think it's anybody's preference for their kids. Like, Hey, whatever you do, be stagnant and stare at one thing <laughs> yeah. that kind of hurts your eyes. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not natural. So, yeah, it's not. And so this gives them the opportunity to at least spread their wings a bit in their off time and and bike around and get out. And we're very fortunate to have this this space yeah. to go to. Are you fishing? You know what I mean? Do, do, can you fish in, the, in, the, we in just, those parts? We, well, I, I fish because my son, my oldest son fishes. Like, okay. I, I am not a, a fishing people. You know, I am not from fishing folk. <laughs> um, <laughs> the spates are not... We're not known oh, for our outdoor skills. Can you catch a fish? I <laughs> yeah, mean, if, if, I catch a fish. You can fish? Okay. So you, you, yeah. you, I've caught a fish. It's not the catching fish. I, I got a nice rod and reel. I got, I know what bait to get. I know, I know, I cast well. <laughs> I know how to fish. I'm not big on then killing and gutting the fish. That's oh, where. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's where I kind of like. Oh, uh, do we have a guy who could? <laughs> but that's part of the thing. If you fish, if you're a true outdoorsman. Yeah. And you're respecting the outdoors. Like my, my oldest son, Steve, he's been in, he's been a fisherman since he was six. He just fell in love with it with his grandfather. And so he's got a vest with all the gear and he gets on a paddleboard and boop, boop, out there, you know, cast. He, he, I'll tell you a story about Steve in a second. But his grandfather and his uncle, when he was learning to fish, they said, look, you can fish. And this is back when he was six, seven years old. They said, you fish or you catch a fish. One, first one, second one, you go, hey, Grandpa, I caught a fish, and I come and help you. And then I don't. Right. Because you have to understand that if you're going to take life from the water, you have to respect that life. Yeah. You have to handle that life with respect and, you know, eat the food that you, you know, go prepare it. So my son knows every step. He knows how to, he catches them well, then he knows how to clean them and cook them and, you know, consume them. So he does the whole thing, and it's awesome. Good young Steve, man. Here's my fishing story for Steve. So Steve, we were at the place called the Blue Hole, which is this, it's about an hour and a half drive with a 45 minute hike outside of town. And it's gorgeous. Mm. And it's about a 50, 60 foot uh, cliff that, or, you know, rock face that you climb up and then jump off and it's ice cold water and it's stunning. Um, and there's some pretty decent sized salmon. Mm. floating around in there mm. and we went there last year and steve mm. was like next year i want to bring my fishing pole and i'm like all right you want to deal with all that on a hike sure and he did so he brought it and he hiked up the side of the so it's a rock enclosure like it, it, you know the, the the water has cut through this path so it's a winding river and then you get to where blue hole is this deep deep hole where you can jump in from from great heights and it's surrounded by two cliffs it becomes this narrow uh river passing through these these you know kind of sheer rock faces and he was up about 30 feet fishing and he caught a salmon a big salmon usually we're catching trout here in the lake oh, he I caught a trout. sizable salmon mm. yeah and trout's great and it's easy and it's small they're manageable You're you right. know and uh he got a salmon that was obviously a beautiful fish but big and he's wrestling with it and he's got a pole that i got him whenever you know, a couple years ago, and it just snapped right in half. Boom. And he had the fish half out of the water and the pole just splintered. And so, and the fish landed on a, on rocks, didn't land in the, in the water. So now you obviously don't want to be cruel to the fish and you've got the remnant. So the remnants of your gear. So Steve had to scale down, down to the rock face, which was not easy untangle his broken pole which he brought with him because we don't know litter and then jump in the river and swim up river to where the, the uh, bank and bring the fish with him via line it looked like he was taking his fish for a walk you know like he had the <laughs> line and he's pulling the fish and swam upstream and got to the bank and got his fish out and 
did his, you know, did what you do to a fish to get it ready to eat. But it was it was so dramatic and exciting. Um, How and for old him, he? a kid who loves fishing, he's now he's fourteen. Um, he but so he's been doing this for you know seven eight years now. So he's it's old hat. Yeah. Oh, well, he wants to go fishing. I will fish with him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're asking me if I I, I will do, because my sons do it. That's right. fun for me. Right. And my other two sons, they like to cast, but they really they're kind of hoping they don't catch anything. Like they like the act of socializing and standing there and casting, and they kind of hope they want they catch something. And they have. They both caught fish, but Steve, like the first time he went out here, he caught five trout. Like he just <laughs> he's into it. Are you a fisherman? Are you I, somebody who likes to fish? I, I am not. I, I well, you know, I do enjoy it, but you know, I just haven't, you know, taking taking the time to to get into it. You know, it it, it it's uh, you know, there's a barrier of entry. You got to you got to you got to get the pole. You got to get the gear. There's that. that. You know, yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna really do it, you know, uh, right. But I I think it's it's fun. It's fun. Um, our, you know, NZ, my son is 14 years old as well. So we're going through some of the similar um, aspects of phases uh, of life. Phases yeah. Of, of life. Young, young you know, boys becoming young men and, and all that good stuff. You know, actually, yeah. I just had I just had the talk. I just had the talk. But, and now there, there's a couple of talks. You mean like the birds and the bees talk? I just had the uh, the birds and the bees and in, in, in the talk of like yeah. you know son this is this is what uh, this is this is a condom this is what it looks like you know yeah you we gotta... started having those conversations like earlier than I thought because the school had a program that was you know your 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 body your life you know some sort of health and yeah sexuality uh, class way young and I was like oh, aren't we you know beating the rush here <laughs> but the teachers are like no Not you gotta yeah. get out ahead of it you know yeah, education is power that's right and you know knowledge is important and yeah. sure enough it's been great but there's nothing that my sons like less than me going hey steve how you doing good listen masturbation what do you think you want to talk about it they're like god no go away oh, no, hurling it's... things at me <laughs> Oh, I mean, they get, they, he gets red. He got red in the face. He, you know, but I said, I said, you know what, son? I said, we just, you know, you got to be, you know, you're a young man now. Because he wasn't even like, you know, he wasn't paying attention to to, uh, to girls. But his mom is like, you know, we, because he lives in Hawaii, as you know. And she's like, you know, we take him to the, he goes to the beach. He's surfing now. And she's like, these, these, these older girls, they're, they're looking at him. They're, and she goes, it's just freaking me out. Just, you know, they look at him at, with that, uh, you know, those hunger eyes. Yeah. And, uh, and he just now has, is aware uh, of what's going on. So I, I'm glad that he's a late bloomer. Uh, and I hope that. Uh, I hope yeah, that, man. Yeah. You're, you're from L.A., right? Are you, where, are you born and no, raised? I, 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 where are you from? Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, that's right. I, I don't know why I got that wrong. You're from Nash. So Nashville, Tennessee is where you're from. Mm-hmm. And, born and, and raised. Born and raised. Were you acting all, all along when you were like a little kid? Were you? Well, were you I mean, I, doing it. I was acting all along in so much school theater and that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I, boy, I was always into it and doing it as a hobby where I could where I could do it meaning like local theater that kind of stuff a couple of films would come through town and I auditioned and got like you know one or two little speaking roles when I was a kid but for the most part it was I was obviously a, high, a student first and playing sports as well and so acting was a, a real passion but it wasn't like I was trying to be a, a child star at that age I was just enjoying it for what it was yeah um, and Nashville's a great town for that because it's a great it's a great city to grow up in got a nice balance of conservative family centric opportunities and I don't mean conservative in a political way I mean just very sort of it's a town built on families it's and, yeah. but then it also has the music side and the artsy side like it's a, it's a good it's a good balance I got to see a lot of cool bands play when I was a kid because my parents would take me to see music and so it was it was a good it was a good balance that's great I don't think See, this beard is not the beard of a native Los Angeles guy. You look at his beard, you go, this man's from the sticks. You know, <laughs> that, I'm from so the other true. side of the Mason-Dixon line. 
That's so you know? true. That's so true. This I is know not like if USC, I were from LA, but... this would be. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I went to college in California, but yeah. if I this if I were from LA, this would be trimmed. Yeah. You know, it'd be trimmed right here. Yeah, trim. Right now, I look like if I, I could grab a musket, <laughs> and go, you know, go reenact Antietam. You know what I mean? Like I look like a Civil War reenactor right now. Um, well, you were in Band of Brothers, but you didn't. You didn't have a beard in uh, Band of Brothers, right? That's World War Two. In World, World War Two, they were all clean shaven, you were, man. You were clean shaven, yeah. You were clean and, and very uh, baby faced. Yeah, you were. That was a great. That was a yeah. great role for you. You you really. Um, that was big. That was a big. That was, that was a, big. a great role for everybody. I mean, yeah. that was a cool mini series to be a part of. It's it was. I'm still super close with. I would say 80 percent of the guys I worked with were still in good contact. And 15, 20 percent are close personal friends and have been since we shot that, which was a long time ago now. That's the kind of job where the job suddenly it, it, the experience is bigger than the job, mm. even though the job is huge, even mm-hmm. though the project was huge, even though it had power players behind it and all, and, and money and prestige. It, what it became was this sort of bonding story of the actors who were trying to reenact the bonding story of the actual men who fought in the war Mm. and this sort of confluence of those two things. Cause the real veterans would come visit us. We were in constant contact with the real veterans. Mm. If you're, if the gentleman you portrayed was still alive, you're in contact with them. If they weren't, you're in contact with their family. And so it really was this mixed bag of, writers producers working years in advance before we ever showed up but then actors come in to step into those roles and the men you're portraying or the men who knew the man you're portraying suddenly to see you as an actor and start seeing you as that person so when they visit set for example i wasn't richard i was muck and Mm. everybody would call you know the guys would we all met each other as actors and as our character name. So we all address each other by either our rank or our character name. It'd be like, you know, you and I know each other. You're Elijah. I've known your name is Elijah since you introduced yourself as Elijah. But it'd be like if we worked together for five months, day in, day out, living in the same hotel. And then you, you know, came to me with lunch one time and said, my, my name's actually Rudiger, so please call me Rudiger. And you're like, what? And so you like Elijah would be burned in my brain. I'd be like, Rudiger, like it, it would be very difficult. And we all met each other by character names. So I will still call some of those dudes by their character name and they and them to me, we will do the same. Wow. Seeing, I, I use Michael Cudlitz as an example. I call him Bull all the time. He played Bull Random one. I call him Bull. Wow. And it, that's just normal because that's how we all met each other. Yeah. And that was that kind of that just is a sort of tiny story that sort of tells kind of what that was like. It was a very, very, very intense bonding experience. We had boot camp mm. and we were, you know, we were hired not to be actors, but to be the guys who really fought and died in a war, which comes with a, you know, pretty significant amount of responsibility mm-hmm. because you're not trying to make choices like I think I would do this. Somebody already did it. You're trying to do what they did and not screw it up. Mm. <laughs> it, was, it was about like, don't try to act it. Just try to do it and don't ruin it because they already did it correctly once. Yeah. So you're re- you're in a way you are acting, but you're also reenacting. And it's a combination of those two things. And you've got the the weight of the eyes of the men who survived upon you while you're doing it. And that wow. made it. Uh, that made it uh, intense, and I think that lent itself to the bonding part of it. Why we all got so close. That's so cool. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's such a that's a that's such a huge uh, a huge experience, you know, to bond with those guys. You've had this long career, uh, you know, as an actor. Uh, you know, you, like you said, you went to U, U uh, USC, right? USC. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, were you yep. uh, a theater major there or film? Theater major theater major which for people who don't know theater major that essentially means acting major it doesn't mean i was just you know limiting myself to only being on stage but that's what the major is called so that's what i was a theater major yeah Yeah. how was your experience at usc i loved it yeah you know i i'm from nashville went to a small high school Mm -hmm. small all boys high school 
and really wanted the wanted to move to LA because I knew what I wanted to pursue. I wanted to get I wanted to be an actor and I wanted to be in the TV and film side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to go to a big school. I wanted the mm-hmm. big school experience. I wanted mm-hmm. the big football team and the big you know the athletics and the excitement of all that. You know, I kind of looked at three schools essentially when I was going to college: U- mm-hmm. UCLA, USC, and Occidental. Mm-hmm. Um, all three are great schools. And they're all awesome. Um, eventually, you know, USC won the day because it had both the theater elements and the, you know, big sports teams and all that stuff. The big, the, what I associated with the college experience, which was sports. I love sports. I love watching sports. I love college sports. So I wanted to be able to go and cheer on my team. Yeah. And immerse myself in that kind of world. Yeah. Um, it's crazy that you came from a boys school because I went to you. Did you know I went to a boys school in Cleveland? I feel like I now that you say that, I feel like we might have we might have had that conversation, I, I, but I had forgotten yeah. about that. I from like where to what, like what grades? K through twelve, pretty much. And it's all boys K through twelve. All boys K through twelve. There was one uh, a part of my junior year I went to another uh, co-ed school, but I came back my senior year. So yeah, pretty much I'm a lifer. K through 12, all boys school. Genius, man. I, I went seven through 12 at my yeah. all boys school. Yeah. And it's loved a unique it. experience. I, I loved it. I mean, I didn't know anything else, you know. Uh, um, no, I didn't either. But <laughs> uh, I know a lot of people are like, you know, even friends of mine didn't necessarily have the experience I had. I loved it. I have two sisters mm-hmm. and no brothers. So I really enjoyed the, the male bonding energy yeah. of that school yeah i played you know i played football i got my ass handed to me on the field <laughs> you know and i loved it like i was in for all that crap yeah um yeah and then still went over to the girls school and did theater and did and did go. the other things that i i found interesting which was you know not a bad way to be social yeah. it didn't make me popular but at least i got to see the girls you know they were physically there um but yeah i i i uh, you know, if I lived in Nashville, if I were raising my sons in Nashville, I would want them to attend my high school, Montgomery Bell Academy. I would want them to attend my high school because I loved it. I had a great experience. Yeah, I see um, the same thing with with, with Enzi. Like if 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 we, you know we lived in lived in Cleveland, I would want him to to attend university school. Uh, yeah. it is a, a profound experience to be around these guys because you know these schools like this they typically are. Uh, have a strong um, academic program, uh, the mm-hmm. strong uh, athletic program, also yep. strong uh, in arts, because they want they want us to be well rounded uh, young men. Exactly, sort of the Renaissance design of yeah. you know Renaissance men, yeah. gentleman, scholar, athlete. That's yeah. the that's the motto of the school, and and that and they live that motto. I mean, that's what they churn out. Yeah, uh, I respect it a lot, and it's and and the school I went to is very very southern and i think all the ways that the south is wonderful mm. every area has its you know its shortcomings mm-hmm. but I, I, I personally am a very proud southerner i'm aware of where we've made massive mistakes as mm-hmm. a culture mm-hmm. but there's also a lot about the south that's interesting that's steeped in history and steeped in in a sense of decorum mm-hmm. and yeah I, I think those elements are preserved well in this school and passed down to the young men who attend it so there's a lot about that I find I find great. Very great. different than raising a kid in Southern California. Not that one's better than the other. Yeah. But, you know, I'm from Nashville. I live in Los Angeles. And that's a massive number of miles between those two. Yeah. And those miles represent massive cultural differences as well. Mm-hmm. So you are a long way from home Yeah. when you are a freshman in college at USC. And, you know, three months earlier, you were a senior in high school in Nashville, Tennessee. Is a yeah. big difference, big a big time. learning curve socially big and everything else. That's um, why. That's why. And I'm I've so talked good. to my sons about it too. Go I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say I've talked to my oldest boy about like the idea of going to an all boys school, and he has said, and I think wisely so. He's like, "Glad you loved it. That's awesome. I've only got brothers. Like there's me and two other dudes." I'm not really chomping at the bit to then only be around dudes all day. Smart man. I'm like, eh, not, not wrong. And, you know, there is a certain amount of you don't fall off the truck knowing how to be 
you know, social. You learn social skills in the field. And I don't just mean dating. I mean anybody. Yeah. Meeting people of different cultures, of different backgrounds, of different socioeconomic strata, and the other gender. Mm -hmm. You certainly do not know those things by nature, especially if you're not with a sister all day long. Or, I mean, they, obviously they have a great relationship with their mom, but that's a grown woman. They're not growing up with the female. It's different when you grow up with women yeah. also growing up. Yeah. You know, like I did with my sisters. That, that, that gives you a, a different perspective on the journey that women go through. And affects how you approach dating and how you approach, you know, the female friends and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I think he's wise to recognize that he feels like it would be a drawback for him to be an all male house off to a, uh, you know, barring my wife, but an all brother house off to an all all guy school it would be a lot. Yeah, yeah, it, it it would be a lot. And my and my sister went to an all girls school, and. Uh, uh, in uh, seventh through twelfth, and it was interesting because she went to an all girl Catholic school, and I went to an all boy Jewish. It, it you know wasn't quote unquote called a, a Jewish reform school, but it was a prep school that was predominantly uh, Jewish reform. And then I went to a, a school in Kidron, Ohio, for just a half a year, and it was in a Mennonite school in Amish country, and. Uh, oh. So, I mean, it was it, these, and then my mom's from the South. So I used to go to Florida, you know, every summer, Georgia, every summer. And, and I always say, you know, when, you, when you're like this fish out of water growing up, it really uh, it lends well in our profession. When you've had these, mm -hmm. uh, this amalgamation of experiences. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I would assume that even you going to an all boys school and having this camaraderie that you were very familiar with aided you in band of brothers because it was a you know it was it was a, it was a brotherhood that you were experiencing there. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think you're a hundred percent right. I think I think the fact that I and I thrive on that energy so much. Yeah. And I, and there are kind of three big chapters of my life that that look like that. Mm -hmm. And one is obviously high school. Mm -hmm. Go through all boys high school. Band of brothers being number two. For sure, because because the way guys, and I, I I can't speak to all guys, but I can say in my journey, you know, sort of the the social litmus test you get with guys my age in the situations I've been in is you you break each other's chops like you, that's you how do. it sort of you plays you, out. Well, here's the thing: you break each other's chops, and you it, it's not just like the physical prowess, like you, as you're saying. I'm I, 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 sorry to in, interject, but you're absolutely right. It's like right. you're around a, a lot of testosterone. You got guys right. who are literally, you know, you know, you got the physical, like, you know, can I take you? Can you take me? I mean, are we gonna go to, you know, because right. this is back in the day we grew up when, you know, it was okay. You could fight. It was okay. It was like you know, a fist, a fist fight. A fist fight was that was that was good. You know, some right. If, if it needed to happen, you know, hey, let's take this out. Uh, let's take this out to the field and let's go. Right. Uh, right. Just don't get caught. But then it was just like the uh, the the dozens shooting the dozens, right? Yeah. I mean, you you had yeah. to be you had to be witty, man, because these guys would come. That's what I'm would, saying. They would come with jokes. <laughs> and if you, well, that's what I'm saying. Like you, you have to, you got to keep your head on a swivel and your wits about you at all times. All times. And you can't take anything personally, because that's what they're looking for. Yes. Sign of weakness. <laughs> like so I'm going to make a joke. I'm going to break your chops. I'm going to give you crap about this. And then the second you go, hey, they're like, oh, I'm sorry. Did I upset you, your majesty? Or what? You? They use different language. I'm keeping yeah. it clean for the podcast. Yeah. But you know what yeah. I mean? Your mama. Like, and first of all, I loved that. I'm like, part of the reason why I love playing sports is, yeah, I got my, I got, I, I, I sucked in football. And so I got beat up, not like, you know, mugged. I mean, just knocked around because I was basically a tackling dummy for, for the whole thing. But I loved it. And and that was bonding and that the great athletes saw that I didn't give a shit. I was going to get knocked down. I was going to get back up and get my position. They're like, all right. Yeah. He Let's may be go. a brick shy of a load, but he's yeah. in it to win it. I yeah. like him. You're right. So you win, you win that. Right. And then be, by being quick witted and, and by trying to use your wits and your smarts to avoid conflict. Right. You avoid conflict. You end up, you know, 
being the guy who can withstand this situation and you're going to defend yourself because, and I'm sure it's true for girls too. So please, anybody who's hearing this, don't think I'm making a, a sexist comment. I only can speak to growing up as a young man because I only did it once and I was a young man. Yeah. But like everybody has their skill set. I'm not a tall guy yeah. and I'm not a buff dude and I'm not shockingly handsome. So I better be funny or I'm screwed. Yeah. Like, you know, you got to kind of fall, find your slot. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the smartest guy in school. Like, you know, so my slot was I'm going to be loose and fun and goofy and maybe push a little bit and get in trouble in class because I, I want to, you know, win that, you know, win kids over being the funny guy, but also I'm going to be super respectful and charming and pleasing to the teachers. Like that's the slot I fell into. Yeah. And I, and I, you, but you have to find that slot because you're in with the guys and they're going like, you don't seem like you fit in this slot. And you're like, all right, well, okay. You know, it's like trying to find a, a, a seat at the lunch table and everybody's like, nope, keep walking. And you've got to sort of navigate your social skills until you figure out. And you get knocked down a couple of times in those, physically. And you, you say something you think is funny and people are like, shut up, dumbass. And you're like, well, that went over like a Led Zeppelin. <laughs> or you, you know, you, you try to be like tough guy and that only makes people more mad or whatever. Like right. it's just... You step in it. Yeah. You step in it, and that's how you learn not to step in it. Right. And that's how you learn your skills. You know, I talk to I talk to my boys a lot about comedy and humor, not like professional. I mean, like humor. You're a you're a witty guy. I'm a witty guy. What do you take out into the streets, into the social circles? And I'm like, you, the joke is never about somebody else. Mm, that's right. It's always about you. Yeah. You know, you're always you can always be the joke. Yeah. You can all, because then you're, and I don't mean self-deprecating, I don't mean putting yourself down, but you are your best straight man. Yeah. Use yourself as that guy. Yeah. Because um, the second you start turning on somebody else, you breed it, they may not be ready to play that way, and That's you right. could look like a, a yeah. asshole. You know, yeah. you look like a bully. That's right. Um, or they might rise up and, and not feel like taking crap from you, and you find yourself in a scuffle that you didn't mean to get into. <laughs> That's right. So... Yeah. You know what I mean? So you have to learn that. And you kind of learn that typically the hard way. But I think, you know, something I want to add about the all boys school experience. You know what was good for me? I was a late bloomer. Mm. And I think not having social pressure to impress girls at school helped me a ton. Now, yes, it might you. be a drag to some dudes who are like, man, I need that audience. I want the women energy. And I and I want that. And I like that now. Mm -hmm. I, like, I love being around women. I lo I've loved it. I have always had sisters and female friends. Like I, I enjoy female energy, but in those sort of volatile pubescent years of developing, yeah, I would never have won that war. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, jousting for female attention was never going to be my strong suit. Mm. So it was good that I could, I could develop my own sense of humor and my friendships with these guys solely based on, my sense of humor and my friendship with these guys. There was no end game. There was yeah. no to impress blah, 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 right. or to get the attention of blah, blah, blah. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, no, I screwed up, and now now blah, blah, blah won't like me. Right. Blah, blah, blah wasn't there. <laughs> that she wasn't there. Us. Yeah. No. The resilience that it has that taught you, you know, like, um, it, it, it has aided me very well in this business because this, this business is so full of, uh, you know, rejection and no's. Yep. People celebrate uh, the gigs that you that you get. You know, of course, people know you for the Banner Brothers, Jericho and uh, Supernatural. Uh, and, and now you're directing, which is phenomenal. And I certainly want to talk about that. But like, you know. You it builds a, a tough skin because people know the roles that you've you've you know garnered. They don't know about the roles that you were up for, like the the you know that you didn't get. Uh, yeah, right? and there's a lot more of those, right? I mean, there's a lot more that you don't get. Right. And some sometimes the ones you do get, no one ever sees. I mean, it's not mm. to say, like, well, I mean, I'll use our movies example. I, I'm very proud of our movie. I think Three Blind Saints was a ton of fun. It, net, it has an audience. It doesn't have a huge audience. You know, yeah. it didn't break out big. It was a great experience. Glad we did it. Still friends. I mean, you and I are friends. I talked to Brad a lot. Wilson, uh, Audrey's still in our social group. Yeah. Good people. Yeah. Um, but the movie 
you know, we worked our ass off, put our best foot forward, and chips fall where they may. That's just the that's life in the big city. That's right. I, I always say that I think I got some of my best acting advice from my high school football coach because of what you just said. Yeah. Because because being the tackling dummy for the team is probably a better analogy for real life than being the star QB. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? You star QB and you have the cush gig of being the good looking leader of the high school. You can only go down. Right. All you can do is twist your knee and find yourself on the bench right. or not make the college cut. And now you don't know what to do with yourself or use it to your advantage. And, and that you're charming and witty and you go on, to do great things as a handsome dude. But my point is when you are middle of the pack and you know, you want to not be in the middle of the pack, but you know, it's going to take a lot of, uh, well, getting knocked down and getting back up to emerge from the masses. Sports was a great parallel universe for that. It is, you know, and, and, and my, my high school football coach was Tommy Owen, great guy, man, a few words, just a, a, a football coach through and through yeah and and didn't suffer fools lightly and <laughs> you know one of my favorite tommy owen moments one point i was a sophomore all gung-ho i was a, a backup wing back and when i say backup i mean way back up <laughs> um <laughs> like couldn't back up any further like <laughs> against the wall back up but at some point tommy owen He's out there, Coach Owen, he's running uh, the first team defense, right? He's practicing with the guys who start. And he's lining up the dummy offense. That, you know, we're emulating the, the opposing team for the game, big game. And he yells, give me a wing back. And I, I sprint out there. I'm like, I'm gung-ho. I'm all in. And I sprint out there and get in the huddle right in front of him. And he looks at me and he goes, give me a different wing back. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, Roger. Okay. I'll, I'll go back to the, but, <laughs> but that was the, that was the base of our relationship. He ended up really liking me because I was the guy who would sprint off the sideline to go stand there. You're ready. You ready and get shit on. That's right. Yeah. And get shit on, but, and then come back out the next time. Yeah. And that's what the acting business is. The yeah. acting business is you gear up, you get ready, you go out, you lay it on the line. They shit on you and you pick up your toys, go home. Get the shit off of them and get ready to do it again. That's the acting business. And occasionally, shockingly, much to your surprise, you get a job in the middle of all that. And you go, I did? Wow, that's cool. And you go do that job. And that job may be a small play. It may be a commercial. It may be Three Blind Saints. It may be Band of Brothers. It may be something that you're proud of that no one ever sees. It may be a role in Supernatural that you think you're doing one of and 15 years later, you're still involved in the show. You just don't know. So it's, it, you're constantly as an actor, probably as an artist in other fields as well, but definitely in acting, you are constantly throwing darts without any clue where the dartboard is. You do not know what you're aiming for. You're just doing your best to throw your best dart and hoping that it, you know, lands in something, catches purchase and sticks. I'm so glad you articulated that for those listening and and, and those watching, because that is the truth. What you just said is the truth. And I know that these, you know, these young folk coming out of uh, these schools, the young folk who are pursuing the business and, you know, it's okay to have uh, to have high hopes. It's okay to, to, to want to land or ha- have the intention to land the series rag or the big, you know, the, the big uh, lead in, in a film. But the, the mentality that, that you speak to is really setting yourself up for long-term success. But let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. Were there times along the process where you... Uh, like how, how, how did, how did you deal with, you know, the big shots that you didn't get, particularly with the fact that you have a family? Cause, cause, cause you know, right. you and I both have friends who have, who have quit the business for whatever mm-hmm. reason. 
did you did you stick with it because you were just fortunate along the way or did you stick with it because you know because of this exactly what you said you know that something's going to hit eventually so you just keep you know, just stay it's, in the game. It, it's a, it, interesting question uh when I was researching Band of Brothers, when I was uh, already cast in it and reading about soldiers, there was an interesting story, and I think it it fits well in this conversation, where there was a the leader was up there, a bunch of new recruits are sitting in the big room, and it, man, you know America's going to war. They didn't sign up during peace. This is these are these are young men who are going to go to war in the mm -hmm. Pacific the European theater, somewhere. They're going to be in harm's way. And he says just that. The leader, the commander says, you people signed up for war. You're going to face bullets. You're going to face bombs. Look to your right and look to your left. Two out of the three of you, that group is not going to return home from this mm. war. Mm. And the, the mindset of the guy looking to his right and left goes... I feel bad for these assholes because mm. everybody believes they're going to survive. That's the mentality. That's what makes a great soldier. That's what makes that's what makes a great actor is the actor who, when they don't get work, goes their loss. Now there takes a lot. It takes a lot of uh, chutzpah. Chutzpah, yes. A lot of hope and a lot of um, ignorance mm. combined to make that work. Because I'm not sure, you know, they don't they don't recruit 40 year old soldiers, and I'm not sure I would start acting at 40. I know mm. some people start later in life, but at 18, when the stars are in your eyes, and I don't mean fame stars, I mean success stars. You want to be involved in the industry. You're bitten by the bug. You're infatuated with it, and you are willing to take whatever classes you need to take, and do whatever you have to do, and live with however many roommates you got to live, and do whatever shitty job you got to do because you want to act. Because it is all that matters to you. You have no backup plan. You are on the wire and you did not bring a net. That is the mentality of somebody who might make it. Who not might make definitely. It. Right. Might make it. Got might yeah. fight through the barbs and the abuse. Because, you know, it also helps. And this is going to sound like I'm joking. It also helps to have a low self-esteem. <laughs> because you got to think well of yourself enough to be confident. Yeah. But not so well of yourself that when they say you're too ugly for the job, it it throws you into a depression. You gotta have a so balance. like I had constant yeah. people. Go, yeah, yeah, you like, yeah. and I was never like I I never I didn't leave Nashville thinking I'm gonna use my good looks to get ahead. That was never something that was part of my, you know, thought process. So yeah. I never really took a beating in that department. Yeah. But it but it was interesting. I can go back and remember specifically people taking meetings with agents and they go, "You're too funny looking. You're not gonna work." Mm. And you leave that room going, whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, you know, I got, I, I didn't, get, I didn't get, I didn't get a yes from a girl I asked out either. Right. You know, shit happens. Right. So you just, you just forge ahead because you feel like you're going to do good work. You feel like you're going to, you feel like you have a skill. You do your skill in a vacuum because as an actor, you're acting by yourself as you prep for stuff. And then every now and then you get a play. Like I went to theater school. I did a lot of theater in, in college, and got some wins as a stage performer in terms of got to do some great plays, got some great roles, got some confidence and experience there. And then you take it to the streets and you try to, you know, you try to break through the noise. And it's just a matter of every time you either believe it or you don't, meaning they either say you're too ugly for this business and you, be you either believe that or you don't. You'll never work. You either believe that or you don't. You, you meet with the agents like, I just don't see it, man. You either believe that or you don't. And I was young enough and stupid enough and positive enough yeah. to not believe it. Yeah. So I just went through it and th and was like, bummer, you, you know, blows for you. And, uh, you know, but I you never was mindset. resentful. Yeah. You had the I had the mindset. mindset, which it, you, you still take a beating. I mean, yeah. like, yeah. you take a beating. You do. You do. You and take I was a beating. Yeah, we do. And I always feel like for young ladies, it's got to be worse because yeah. just the way they get, like, judge like a you know body imaging guys eyeing them up and down stuff. like a leg yeah. of lamb yeah. yeah it's gross it's gross yeah, it is yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't wish that on your daughter or your wife or your sister you know what i mean yeah. that that kind of thing and yet and women ageism. persevere and ageism with the ladies too ageism you know, it's yeah like, it's like if a lady if an ingenue or a lady hasn't broken through 
you know, uh, by what, 30, 35, you know, it's, it's, you know, for us, it's like, you know, a guy can be, what, in his four, 50s and yeah. even older and still, you know, like yeah. it's not an issue. Your character, if you're a character actor, like if you don't have looks, you know, if, if you don't have looks to fade. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're just going to become more character as you get older, and that's all fine. Yeah. Uh, obviously, actresses still kick ass and do amazing stuff and, and fight harder battles than men have to fight, like in every job. Right. Uh, and it's impressive to see what they pull off. But I really do I really do think there's you have to, you have to be such a crash test dummy to want to do this job and keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think, like you said, like you started this conversation with, people see the wins. They don't see the losses. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about the losses all day long, but in their mind, people are going, yeah, but you won. <laughs> yeah. And then you have to yeah. say, to your, so you say to them, like, did I? Because I still got to work. It's not like, like I did that one job and now I'm on easy street. Nah, man, I'm still like juggling a bunch of stuff to make a career for myself, to pay the mortgage, to raise the children. My wife works like we are a. We are a typical American family. The one difference being I have a high profile profession, but yes. barring that spates are no different than any family out there with two working parents trying to educate their children and raise them in a way that reflects their upbringing and their values and yes. everything else. That's and right. you asked me about raising a family. Look, I, there are plenty of people in our business and you know it too, not yeah. even the dropping out part, people who don't pursue family, because they have this idea of, mm, mm, mm. I'm going to wait till I achieve this. I don't, yes. I, I, yeah, I don't want to do it yet. I'm still like, yes. I don't really want to get married because, you know, I, and I'm, or I'm married, but we're not going to have kids because I still want X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Now, again, easy for me to say, my wife is not an actress, so she wasn't worried about an acting career and being pregnant, which is a whole different mm -hmm. challenge for women. Yes. But for myself, oh, there's my son, Steve, hey, walking Steve. through. <laughs> Hi, hey, it's all good. He's a guy man. who fishes. <laughs> See you, bud. Yeah, uh, this is his classroom. I had to borrow his desk to do the uh, podcast. Oh, that's awesome. Um, if you don't live life simultaneous to those choices yeah. of being a professional actor, sometimes you look up, you're 40, you're 45, you're 50, you're single, and you're like, oh, crap. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, and and everybody's choice is right. I'm not saying everybody wants to get married. I'm not saying everybody wants to have kids. Right. But I I'm not sure that I knew I wanted to get married and have kids until I met the woman I married, and then suddenly I did want to get married, and then we didn't want to have kids. Yeah. It wasn't a life goal, but it was certainly the right thing when I met the right woman. Mm. And I would be bummed if I didn't have that guy walking through this room during this podcast. If my <laughs> right. life were just the successes I had. And I wasn't sharing those successes and failures with uh, the next generation of spates, I would feel a tremendous loss. I don't think I would know that loss because I didn't know how fun being a parent was until I was a parent. You know, I can't um, suggest being a parent to somebody any more than I can advise against it because it's such a personal journey right. and so built upon a partnership and, and everything else. But it's been a win for me, mm. and I and I know that in our business, so many people don't follow that path, thinking that you can't do that and this. Mm -hmm. So anybody listening, family, if you want one, works within any framework that you want it to work in. Yes. It works alongside the arts. It works alongside anything because raising children is really freaking hard, and yes. there's no job you have that's going to make it easy. There's no part of your life that's going to make it a cakewalk it's going to be a massive challenge yeah. to to rear another personality yeah uh in a challenging world whether you have one two or three or four or five children so don't let your career dictate your life let mm. your life dictate your life mm. and the career will come with it you know there's that old yeah. american versus european mentality we live to work they work to live yes work to live work to live you know Work to live. That. I agree with that. Do your job so that you can pay your bills and feel satisfied as, a, as an adult, as an artist, as a mathematician, as a whatever you do. Mm -hmm. And live. And Enjoy live. things. Go, go, go experience things. Don't put your life on hold. And you know this because you're an actor. There's, there's this thing in acting where you go, oh, I don't want to get my hair cut because I just auditioned for this thing. Or 
my agent doesn't want me to get a haircut. <laughs> Do you know what a dumbass that statement that sounds like to an outsider? Like, uh, why would you care if you're, like, and why do we care? Right. That, like, you, like, oh, no, I, if I trim my hair. Acting is about performance. If they're hiring you for your haircut, you've already lost, man. That's like, right. that war is over. That's but right. it gets in your mind, and you start thinking that way, and your agents will say, oh, you know, be careful, because if you change your look too much. And, I, you know, it, it, the business is built to, to break you down, and you just have to not let it break you down. You just have to be Legos, man. You just have to be able to snap yourself back together every time you get kicked. And if yeah. you can do that, then you can enjoy the career and you can enjoy the life and you can do yeah. multiple things at multiple times. And you, I mean, what's so cool about you is that you, you've worked in all these different mediums, film, uh, television, uh, commercials. I mean, I remember one time I saw you had a, you had, you had a national with, uh, with, with Pepsi. And then yeah. you landed Supernatural was a was a big big opportunity for you uh, that mm -hmm. could, you know even after your your role uh, as uh, Archangel Gabriel um, you know you would go and and uh, on these tours and and uh, and, and, yeah. and show up, you know and, and service the, the Supernatural fans around uh, the globe and then you reinvented yourself with a passion for directing so this mm -hmm. forward progress you, you you know and now you just came back recently directed some episodes actually directed yourself in an episode <laughs> as well yeah so yes yeah, you know speak on on this that part of the evolution of of your creative uh endeavors uh, as a director, this has been on your heart for a while, and you and you created a short film that you know had some buzz out there, and and here you are now, uh, acting and directing. Yeah, the directing part is has been a great addition to my pursuits. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by it, but I didn't pursue directing. I didn't major in film. Um, I directed like a little thing in college, little thing here, little thing there more just to challenge myself and see if I could figure it out, you know, mm -hmm. to see if I could understand what was going on. But really for me, it was years and years of working in TV mm -hmm. and working with directors and writing and writing my own stuff and wanting to direct and my writing. own stuff. And, writing. and so I was, I was, I wrote constantly. I still do, but I really years like there's a, I wrote with a fella, Cortland Cox, who's now, he, he created a show called Below Deck and has been off in the island shooting Below Deck, this reality show, for years and years and years. But he and I used to meet at 8 in the morning every day before we had our respective jobs and write mm. for two hours a day. Uh, and if we had to go, and we sometimes we'd meet at 7, sometimes we'd meet at 6. We wrote all the time. Uh, I wrote by myself all the time. I just always found that to be an outlet. In the world of entertainment, I can wake up and write. Ah. It's harder to wake up and act. It's harder to wake up and direct, but I can mm. wake up and, act and write. Um, so I did writing a lot. And I found writing helped me a lot as an actor, and it definitely ended up helping me a lot as a director. Mm. But my point is, I kept having these, I had a couple of films almost get made, you know, the famous Hollywood almost. Um, and they, they were indie films, and I would say to the producers, like, yes, I'd also like to direct it. And they'd be like, Okay, great kid. Anyway, so who do you think we should have directed? You know, you're like, you totally get blown off. And then I was like, hey. And, and then I would realize, well, why the hell would they hire me? Right. It'd be like, a, it'd be like saying, I want to act, I want to act in this, but you don't get to see me act before I show up on set. You just have to trust me. I'm really yeah. good. At a certain point, I realized if I really want to be the guy telling the story visually, mm -hmm. I've got to go tell a story visually. Not a small, I've done a couple of small things. Even I did a feature where I met my wife, actually, a feature called North Beach, but I co-directed that. And it was years ago. And I thought, I've got to update what I can do. Uh -huh. I need to do it by myself. Yeah. So it speaks to my ability to complete the whole thing on my own and tell my own story and create my own visual voice. And so that's when I wrote and directed America 101, which I did right after we did a Three Blind Saints, pretty right. much right after that, because the majority of the crew, Tal Lazar, Audrey Matos pops in for a hot second, uh, Alan Hagen helped me produce it. So it was a lot of 
people from that movie we did came over and helped me make um, America 101. And that's a movie that I wrote and directed, but was not in. Right. I wasn't trying to make it a Rich Spate can, can act piece for my reel because I have a reel. I, I act. I've got that. Not to say you can't always do better and do more, but I didn't need to put myself in my own project. Right. Plus, what I had written really was written in the voice of Rick Gomez, who's a buddy of mine from Band of Brothers, and who's just a powerhouse actor and a great friend. And so I kind of did it, wrote it, going, well, either Rick will do this or I won't do it. Which, you know, put a little pressure on my buddy to say yes. But yes. he did, and it was four days. And that film did really well in the festival circuit, which was my intent. My intent was to take it out there, get it some wins, you know, get it some chalk, so, some uh, some experience in the road. So I could then go to producers that I knew and go, hey, I've, I've made a short film. And it's played 10 festivals, mm. which I thought sounded better than I've made a short film and no one has seen it yet. Like, you know, <laughs> you wanted it. Like, it's been out there. It's, it's getting proven. It ended up playing over 30 festivals all over Europe and the States. And it was a great, great uh, calling card for me. Right. And that's what helped me break into TV. I, it, I didn't get an episode of TV based on that. Mm -hmm. But what I did do is that short film got me hired to start directing commercials. Mm. So I started directing commercials and I started and directed and I directed commercials for Pepsi and a lot of their subsidiary products and some other uh, products out of uh, some regional stuff out of New York and that area because that's where I was directing at the time. And then a lot of Pepsi stuff that turned out really cool and kind of taught me how to use green screen and visual effects and to direct with somebody else's money on somebody else's time frame because you're doing your own thing. I shot my own thing in my own yard or my buddy's office or, you know what I mean? You're just right. kind of using what you have access to right. versus somebody going, all right, you have this much time. And when I watch the monitor and you do something, I'm going to go, nope, don't like it because it's a commercial and you have 30 people who have an opinion that you have to service. Right. Um, so that, so I, I learned all these boots on the ground skills like in, day one because i went from doing my own thing to doing their thing and their thing is a lot more expensive and so doing a bunch of commercials was a great film school for me and then from that i applied to and got into the warner brothers directors program mm. and that was a great experience because that basically kicked your butt back into school essentially and you were having to drop shot lists and edit lists and all these things that Maybe like I'd never I'd never worked with with schematics, you know, dr overhead drawings of sets where you draw your camera positions and your actor positions and had somebody, you know, have to show that and have somebody approve or not approve it. Like it, it was mm. it was a whole lot of flop sweating and challenging yourself, which is good. Mm. You know, you get you rest on your laurels too long. You're not using all your skills. So it was good to be pushed and challenged. And from that show. I shadowed, I mean, from that experience on the, as a, doing the program, I then shadowed Supernatural directors because that was the one show I had an association with at the time, mm. Mm. having been an actor on it. And I shadowed directors up in Vancouver, three different directors. And finally, after having done the program, the Warner Brothers Directors Program, after having directed a bunch of commercials, and after having shadowed a bunch of directors up there, I think Jeremy Carver, who was the showrunner at the time, and Bob Singer, thought mm. if we don't give this kid an episode he's never going to leave so i managed to you know soften them up <laughs> to, into giving me an episode and and that and that was that was the shot i needed that was the shot i was looking for and hoping for and one episode of supernatural turned into 11 i did 11 in the last three years of the show oh wow um, as a director it was great and now i'm directing lucifer i'm going to in october which i'm not sure when this podcast drops but in october 2020 i'll be directing my fourth episode of Lucifer, uh, which is a Netflix show. So I've really enjoyed getting to take everything that I've learned over the years and bring it to the directing perspective because yeah. I can't play every role. I'm limited to what I'm, what I can play based on what I look like, right? My right. age, my gender, you know, my physical, uh, traits, but in my mind, I can play everything. <laughs> I was going to say, if you need, so a, as a, if director, you need a, if you need a black guy, you know, <laughs> you know, if, 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 if. <laughs> there you go. I can't play that guy. People don't like that. There's a black but guy you in Vegas, man. If you need a black guy in Vegas, you know, you know the call. Uh, There's the title of your book, A Black Guy in Vegas. Um, 
But I, but so that's what I'm saying. Like it, it, it enables me to use your brain and go, oh, I think this character would do that. Like yeah. you play all the characters, you play and you play the camera and you play the visuals, but you get to ta- you get to use all your acting skills and your writing skills. Yeah. Because I'm working with the writers and developing the the story as the as pre production goes, and I don't write it; they've already written it. But they, but my, I try to come to the table with ideas that are taking what they're doing and and adding to it, you know, because they've done a great job always. Right. And having conversations about stuff and, and getting shot down, which is also part of the process, but that's fine. (laughs) Uh, And so it's, 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 yeah, there's a technical element. There's a massively technical element in terms of camera position and and what you're doing and, and how you're pacing it and how you're shooting it. But you're using all of those acting skills, man. Like you're just, you're using them all. How do you describe, if you had to describe now, uh, the Richard Spate style of directing. Because I was I was reading an article, and you were talking about Bob and, and some of the other guys, and who who you have de- developed uh, a lot of respect for, and the way uh, these guys approach uh, directing, and and it it so I, I was like wow you know I wonder what. Richard style, if he had to describe it, would be r- right now. All right, and and I think right now is a good caveat because I think everybody's style changes all the time yeah, as you evolves. develop, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think I'm an actor centric director. Mm-hmm. I think that my experience of being in front of the lens for years, mm-hmm. so, sometimes as a series regular, but more often than not as a guest on the show. Mm-hmm. has given me a, a toolbox that I can use to get the best performances out of performers in a very short amount of time because mm-hmm. TV moves quickly. Mm-hmm. And my goal is for people to feel comfortable mm-hmm. so they do their best work um, and safe so they do their best work. Comfortable mm-hmm. meaning welcomed on the set, meeting the crew, the cast, understanding the vibe, and safe, meaning try something. Let's have a conversation. You're not going to get yelled at by me. I'm not going to be in a tent 200 yards away going, wrong, do it again, but better. You know, that's not my style. <laughs> right, that's not your style. I, and I know that the different directors, and you could, you could line up five guys or gals and five directors, ask, and you, might, you probably could find a very different question or very different answers because... I do have good friends who work in this business and they'll go, no, man, the lensing and the shot style is the most important part of the story of the, of T of a scene. And I'm like, to me, it's performance. It, you look at European movies or indie films, which seem to be more in line with this style. You can watch, hold on. What's up, Frank? Sorry. Um, but, uh, I finished all my school work. Oh. So can I go to Xander and Dawson's? Cause it's uh, school give me work. 10 minutes and then I'll come talk to you about it. Okay. That was Frank. I love that. Say I hi, Frank. Him. Hey, hi. Frank. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> he said, how you doing? How you doing? Good. 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 All right, I'll, I'll be out in a minute. <laughs> that's my youngest. Now you've met my oldest, and now you've met my youngest. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so to me, yeah, you can watch a scene that's two characters walking down a wooded path towards the camera. The camera doesn't move. Mm-hmm. It's framed beautifully, yeah. but the camera doesn't move. You have two actors walking towards you talking and they arrive close to the lens finish their conversation and walk on that can be a scene Mm -hmm. you are totally wrapped up in that scene if the acting is great and the writing is great right even if the writing is eh, but the acting is great you're all in yes you can take that same scene start with a helicopter shot cover it this way Cover this way, do a low angle leading them, do a camera that flips over and follows them. And if the writing is shit and as the acting is shit, you're getting you're getting uh, popcorn during that sequence because you don't care. Right. So to me, it's all about the performance. It's all about the performance. And, you know, these these writers that I've worked with on TV turn out great material. So the writing is never the never like you got a great template right there. Yeah. You just need great actors to give it life. And yeah. Again, I've been lucky that the leads on the shows I work on are really good, but you got to bring in these guest stars. And it's mm. intimidating to be a guest star, to show up and maybe you have one big scene, but you haven't 
you, you have three hours to do it and then you're out of there or you have a bunch of scenes but we're doing them all in a day so we're going to be moving quickly and you know you're new to the thing maybe you're on the younger side or whatever and nerves can be involved and you know you've got to get people to the place where they can do their best work for you so you can do your best work very quickly and i think because i have been on that side and i yeah. know what it's like to walk in that room yeah. to walk on that set to see maybe an argument with the lead actor who's annoyed about something else and he's going i don't care tom whatever hi uh I, i'll be playing the doctor and you're like christ you know this oh man yeah. um so i know what that's like yeah and so I, like. I feel like there, there there's a there's a safety that i deliver yeah to performers because they typically they either know i'm an actor or they figure it out quickly that I'm on their side. I'm not gonna leave them hanging. I always have ideas, but I'm always gonna listen to them. I have a plan that we that it can be flexible if need be, but I am not afraid to tell them that it's not flexible when it can't be. Yeah. And that enables people to feel comfortable. They know that there's a plan in place. They know somebody's watching their back and they know they have a voice if they decide to exercise it. And that to me is my style. That to I me is what I bring that. to the table now as a director. Now I want to now now I want to be directed by you and so, and something. I I feel like I got you do because I'm fun. I I I have I got to put my my hat in hat in the uh, in the ring for that. I mean I I already what you said is so interesting because it's what if I had to uh, take a shot at at you know if you asked me what kind of director do you perceive me to be. That's how mm -hmm. I would have answered it, based on, you know, my experience working with you as an actor, uh, and and, right. and 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 what I know of you as a person. That's what I, uh, you know. So so I, it's so awesome that that you know you are t have articulated your, this this way of because I feel like when I evolve to taking on that that role as a director at some point down the road, mm -hmm. I would be that kind of director because that kind of sensitivity is so crucial and it's what has gotten the best work out of us uh, as, uh, as, as right. actors. Let me ask you this. Close. Uh, I have two questions I want to ask you before we leave. And, and the first one is pertaining to the directing. Now with, with COVID and, and how things uh, or operate, you know how how things operate in the business. Mm -hmm. Self tape becoming the new norm. It has been for a while, but it's really now probably mm -hmm. the real new normal in terms of how actors are seen. What kind of advice, as, from a director's perspective, can would you give to actors who are putting themselves on self uh, on self tape to present mm -hmm. themselves in a way that is uh, will help them garner the job, get the job. Like, are, okay. there, are there things that they're doing that you, you're just like, you know what, you're really great, but th this is this is what's holding you back from me saying yes. Okay. For starters, as you just said, self tape is the new normal. Yes. Self tape is absolutely the new normal. Secondly, I think self tapes are better than having an actor in the room. And I know that's up for debate. I have friends of mine who disagree with me because they like they say, oh, I want to go in and meet the producers. I think that's one of my skills. To me, I've never hired somebody because they were nice walking in the door or nice walking out the door. Mm. I hire them because between action and cut, they blow me away. Mm. So to me, a self-tape, I'd rather self-tape. As an actor, I'll self-tape 10 times out of 10 mm. because I get to put the camera where I want it. I get to do the takes I want to do until I'm happy, and then I move on, which is exactly what a set is like. What a set isn't like is driving across town, waiting in a waiting room for God knows how long, while somebody else goes in and you hear them, somebody else goes in and you hear them, somebody else goes in and you hear them, and then you go in and somebody is like, yeah, just a sec, buddy. <laughs> yeah, okay. I will have the tuna salad. You're having that, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I was being so weird. Uh, what are you reading for? And you're like, and then you're like, you're already nervous and you're thrown off. And there's, it's not an environment that's conducive to excellence. 
And so I will skip that anytime I can skip it. Yeah. So if you're an actor and you're getting a self-tape and you're bummed that you're not going in the room, reverse it. Yeah. You should be elated you're not going in the room because you get to do your best work. Yeah. That's the that's the truth of it. Yep. Now, a certain amount of that, people say, yeah, but the casting director is not there to give you notes. True. You got you to gotta have your act together and be making strong choices. But I've seen a self-tape before that has blown me away where the person's slightly off, and I bring them in to meet me after that so I can talk to them. You know what I mean? So that you, got so them. You, do you cast straight off a of self-tape, or do you – do you? It, and right now, is it like you love the self-tape, but you still want to have a conversation with the, them? Are you having that conversation via Zoom? Is there a point where you need to meet them in person, or you just go, hey – I'll see you. I'll meet you on set. I meet I, I meet him on set because one of the one of the great assets of a good casting director is I can say that person blew me away. Are they good to work with? And the casting director goes like, people love working with them. I'm like, good enough for me. I don't need to meet him. I don't need to have him drive across town because yeah. I'm not. It's not a it's not a dream date. Like yes. we're not going to like I'm I'm bringing them in to do what they just did in that self tape. Right. If they just knocked it out of the park with that self tape. I really don't care what their personality's like as long as they're easy and, yeah. and pleasurable to work yes. with, which yeah. the casting director can confirm for me. Right. Um, I had, I, I, like, I did an episode of Supernatural. I cast a lot off self-tape. I've been blown away by a lot of people, and Supernatural was always very good about going, hey, man, great. You know, we didn't meet him. Nobody met him, but that's a great tape. Let's, let's hire him. We did that for my first episode of Supernatural, the big guest star, the character named Sully, actor Nate Torrance, he was in Cleveland, Ohio, where he lived, reading in his kitchen with his wife, and just knocked the leather off the ball, and we brought him in, and he, you know, he just owned that role. Yeah. Super smart hire by the show, and picked by me. I was directing an episode of Supernatural that the, where I was actually in the episode, and it had Norse demigods in it. Yeah. And nobody they brought in, they were all great actors, but they weren't, they weren't what I was looking for. The casting director and I sat down, and I said, here's what I'm looking for. And so she showed me actors reading for other shows. Never saw them read for Supernatural. But I'm like, that's my guy, and that's my guy. And again, the, the brass at the network approved, and they got hired. And they came to set, and they were phenomenal. The nicest guys in the world. And, it, and at some point, they go, Where's, this is a great role. Because they were there for all seven days, all eight days. This is a great role. Thank you. How the hell did we end up here? And I told them that story, and they're like, oh, my God, I wish more directors did that. I wish I wish more directors would just trust that seeing me play a cop means I can also play a doctor. You don't have to – like, a great actor is a great actor. They can – if they're in the framework of it, even if it might be different words, you can see them – you can you can imagine they can pull that off. The self tapes the higher off. Sometimes it's beautifully professionally lit. Sometimes it's somebody with a tripod and a phone. You know, notes for that. Try not to have distraction in the background. Be sure I can hear you. You know, don't get overly clever, but do what you want. What makes you comfortable to do the scene? Yeah. Um, I, I think there's, you know, Spiel, Steven Spielberg famously doesn't have anybody read the actual sides from the script when he's casting. Yeah. He just has them read material because he wants to see who the actor really is. Mm. And I think that's a process. You know, I have an old, I have a motto. If it's good enough for Spielberg, it's good enough for Spade. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I feel like if, if, it, if it works for him, who am I to say I got a better plan? Um, and I that's think there's awesome. something to that. You see the raw talent. You see that it's there. You cast that person. And if your network is on board and the producers are on board, which Supernatural always was, then you're cooking with gas because you get – I mean, I would say out of the 11 episodes I did, four or five major, major, not small role, major guest stars. I, that's, not, that's not true. Probably five or six major guest stars were self tape. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. I, I appreciate this, man. I I, I want to have you back because, and I know you you got you gotta you gotta go and your, your family, uh, they, they 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 need you back. But here's the thing, <laughs> uh, you know, I wrote this book. And and we because we were talking about dating when we were young men and and, and just so, so this book is called the fine art of romance it's it's a bachelor's handbook because I'm a bachelor nice and nice. Uh, it, it, and so I have to ask you this final question mm -hmm. 
define, from your perspective, the art or the essence of courtship? Hmm. Well, it's been a while. I've been off the field for a for a spell. Yeah. But you, but, but, but you, you're a successfully married man, so so you had to you had to court to to, to yeah, for sure. I think I think I did better. Like part of what charmed my wife and 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 what made us work together is by the time I met my wife, I was comfortable with who I was. Mm. And being comfortable with who you are goes a long way because you're not putting on an act. Not every shoe is going to fit. Not every not every date is going to be a home run. But if you are who you are and you're comfortable being who you are and you're not only you're comfortable being who you are, but you, you sort of exist in your space with confidence, it doesn't mean you have to be overly confident because Lord knows I'm not. It's certainly not with women. But if you exist in your space with confidence, if you know who you are, like being an actor, like being a performer, if you know who you are and are comfortable with who you are and are willing to take a few knocks because you're not who you're not, that goes a long way mm. in the experience. I also feel like, and this is more for male-female relationships. I know, mm -hmm. you know, not every, people have their own preferences, but in the male-female world, I happen to believe, and it's on the old-fashioned side, but manners never go out of style. Mm. That yeah. doesn't mean that women aren't exactly equal to men. They are. It doesn't yeah. mean that they aren't as powerful in the workforce and in a relationship as men. They are. Yes. Throw gender roles out the window. There are no you shoulds and you're supposed tos that exist anymore. They're gone. However, opening a door for somebody is still a kind act. There you go. Making you sure go. a young lady is treated properly in a public space is yeah. still a kind walking, act. There walking is still her space to her for car. That. Yeah. Well, you know, correct. Open, yes. Doing doing the safe things, doing yes. the kind things, yes. doing the right things. Yes. And understanding that though we are equal in many ways overt kindness towards uh women who do all the heavy lifting in our society including having the children and carrying yes. the emotional weight of the world mm -hmm. uh i think is still a value still yes. carries weight and by the way is uh extinct almost mm -hmm. so young men who still demonstrate that genuinely not as some act but genuinely feel it and then embody it i think are not only doing young ladies a service with whom they're out, but mm -hmm. also they're doing themselves a service and society a service as well. Mm. Maybe old fashioned, maybe Southern, but hey, I'm old it's fashioned authentic. Southern. It's so. authentic, man. Yeah. I, I, I really appreciate that, man. And that, that's, uh, that's from the heart. And uh, I, pre I appreciate your time, brother. It's been a fun. Dude, this has been a delight. You, you have to have me back because this is too fun. It's too fun. It's too fun, and and when you get back to LA, uh, I have a good good feeling we're gonna be able to have a, a cocktail, have some dinner. I and, love that. You know what I mean? Like we gotta we gotta meet in person, and uh, so I, I look forward to it. It's been, it's been too long. It's been too long, so we're gonna put that on our agenda and uh, enjoy the family. Uh, take care of yourself, and uh, we'll talk real soon. Hey. I will. You do the same. Stay safe and congratulations on your book and all your success. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Richard Spade Jr., the man, he brought it. Great times. The Fine Art of Romance, a Bachelor's Handbook by Elijah Rock. Fascinating rhythm, it's wonderful, long ago and far away, isn't it a pity, shall we dance, how long has this been going on? We got a guest here who uh, happens to be uh, in Las Vegas. That's right, that's right, I'm here. And here on the Elijah Rock podcast show. Well, Elijah, I, I, I just have to tell you how proud you are to have me on. 
It's really incredible. And your ratings on this particular podcast are going to be through the roof, through the roof, the biggest ever. But as you mentioned, we're here in Las Vegas. And by the way, I have a tremendous Trump hotel. You're welcome to stay there anytime, anytime, as long as you pay, as long as you pay. But it's a beautiful hotel. And like I always say, if it's not a Trump hotel, it's a dump hotel. It's a dump hotel. I, I, I haven't been. Yeah. I, have, I haven't You're more been. than welcome. You're more than welcome. Well, You're I, more than welcome. You'll meet lots of wonderful people. My supporters are gonna. You stay there. They'll like you. They'll, they'll like, like me? you because you're well dressed. You're well dressed. Well, I I didn't know if black people were uh, welcome. Oh, they're well. They're my, I'm sure you watched many of my rallies over the years. You always had one black guy there, great guy, and he came, came with us to all the rallies. He was he was always. I don't know how we got there. He was always there, but I love the blacks. I love the blacks. You love the blacks. I love the blacks. I love all the great blacks. I love Darth Vader and uh, what's his name? The other guy, uh, Malcolm X, all the big well-known blacks. I love them. Yeah. I got a few questions for you. Well, that's what I do. That's what I do best. I've been interviewed by the best, and now I'm being interviewed by you. So I'm Mm. very, very excited. Yes. I'm very, very excited. Well, I I appreciate that. The the, the fact that um, Obama served... Uh, eight years as, eight as years. president. Eight, and, eight years. And, and and it looks like, well, you've only served four. Mm, uh, right, does that right. get your panties in a box? Well, doesn't. You know, I'm going to be back in 2024, and it's going to be it's going to be a Trump slide. Obviously, this last election was stolen. It was fraud. It was a hoax. Mm. The the software was uh, made by Democrats in a radical leftist uh, factory where they manipulated the voting. We had a lot of people. You know, we had. You know, you know what the definition of a conspiracy is, no. right? You know that. You, you know what that is. Yeah. Two people get together. Well. You know, this is the biggest conspiracy ever. 74 million people voted for Joe Biden. That's a conspiracy. That's a conspiracy against me, against me. And that's a horrible, horrible. And we're going to prove that. We're going to prove that in court. You know, this isn't over yet. This isn't over yet. Isn't that over? No, it's not over. We're going to, we're going to be fighting this until 2024 when I come back in. What have you, what have you been up to uh, since, the, since the election? Since, you know, since, since the, since you, the you election lost. months and months ago? Well, yeah. um, first of all, we were, we were fighting in court. For, well, I wasn't. My attorneys were. I was golfing. I was golfing. I, I like to golf at my properties. I always say, oh, you can't talk about your properties. I can now. I can now. So I want to talk about them all the time. They're great properties, fantastic properties. But I do a lot of golfing, and, you know, I've been working on the Trump TV, Trump yeah. TV, which is going to be big, because Fox has been very disappointing, very disappointing. Mm. You know, I say something, and they play it back, which really isn't fair, Yeah, which really isn't fair. That's yeah. sad. That's sad. They take everything Rudy says, every word, and they just play it. And, you know, that's, that's not good, because Rudy's not all there. Yeah, he's, he's missing a few. He's missing a few. Uh, a few. Ever since yeah. that Borat movie, he thinks he's a, a movie star. Yeah, he got. He just got caught with his uh, with his pants down. Right, he got much. his compo- Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Rudy thought like a twenty year old Bulgarian girl was coming on to him. I don't think so. I don't, me, of course, but him, not so much. <laughs> not so much. What, what's your relationship with like Melania these days? Well, you know, Melania and I have had a very unique relationship, as you know, and I've been saying this for many, many years. But she invented social distancing long before the pandemic happened. Mm. Many, many years. You know, because if you watch the videos. I would go to like hold her and she just slapped my hand. Yeah, that I've was seen her that. social distancing. Yeah, that was her social distancing. You couldn't even hold your wife's hand. Like, I couldn't hold. even hold her hand. And she likes to play hide and seek in the White House, which, by the way, was a big house, was a very, very big house. So she'd be gone four or five days and then she'd pop up in another country. And then people said there was a fake Melania. And I said, of course there is. You think we can't even get the real one to stick around. <laughs> so it was nice to have the fake Melania because we paid her and she had to smile. She yeah, had to smile. What was the biggest lesson your dad taught? The biggest lesson my father taught me was to uh, punch back. Mm-hmm. Punch back 10 times as hard. 10 times as hard. If someone says something about you, you got to hit them harder than they ever saw it coming. Mm-hmm. You know? And did you know my father's middle Do you know my father's middle name? No, I, I didn't know. You didn't know? No. His name is Christ. His name is Fred Christ Trump. So I, technically, I'm the son of God. Technically, I'm the son of God. A lot of people don't. A lot of people, I'm, I'm surprised how many people don't know his middle name was Christ. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, the, 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 well, I've even asked some very well people who are like, oh, we love you, we love you, we love you. And I'll say, what's my father's middle name? They go, we don't know. And they'll, 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 I'll tell them, they're shocked. Yeah. Shocked. Well, I'm shocked just hearing Yeah, that. yes. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. everyone knows how much I love uh, religion and God. And God, yeah. great guy, God, great guy. He's made some big mistakes. Not me, I've never made a mistake. 
but he's a good guy. He's a good God. He's doing tremendous work. I'm surprised he didn't n- name you. Your middle name, Jesus. Oh, that would have been great, right? Yeah. That would have been great. Yeah. But then I would have been considered like an immigrant, like Jesus or something. So I'm glad he didn't do that. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of people, it's funny with my middle name because it's Donald J. Trump. And I love the Jewish people, yeah. tremendous people, fantastic people, hardworking people. So good with money. So good with money. And I did move the, as you know, one of the biggest things I've done as president, I moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Mm. And that's why the Jewish people love me so much. So a lot of Jewish people think my name is Donald Jewish Trump, but it's not. It's not. It's genius. It's genius because I'm a very stable genius. Donald Genius Trump. Yeah. yeah. And my, my uncle, by the way, John Trump, he was a one of the smartest people Smartest people ever to teach at MIT. Well, I think I heard you say that. Yeah, smartest John Trump, Professor John Trump, 40 years at MIT. And that's where they keep my blood. Mm. They keep my blood at MIT. I have MIT blood. Because, you know, blood. when you're related to somebody, you yeah. have the same blood. Yeah. So I have the same blood as a genius. That's why I'm a stable genius. Mm. Well, yeah. Interesting. Are, are you Very are you, interesting. Uh, I'm probably the most interesting person you've ever interviewed. Hmm. Are you afraid? <laughs> I'm all- not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> I'm just afraid of how incredible I am. Sometimes I'm, I'm even in all of Are you afraid with all the, the, the lawsuits against mm-hmm. you that, that you, you could end up behind bars? Well, I've never been concerned about that. You know, when I entered the White House, I was involved in 3,800 lawsuits. 3, Most people go, oh, wow, that's a, that's a lot of lawsuits. Not to me. Not to me. Not and to I, know, I mean, you filed bankruptcy how many times? Six times. Six times. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. People say that's a bad. You're a terrible business. I say, that's a good, I'm a good businessman. I'm using, I'm using a, a tool. Mm. A tool. Because you make money off of filing bankruptcy. You do. Because, you, you, look, listen, you buy a car, you file for bankruptcy, you don't have to pay for the car. That's a good thing. Mm. That's a good thing. Good I know how to use that because the, in, in Atlantic City, and I got out before it really went bad. I made a lot of money in Atlantic City. And, you know, some people would say, like, oh, you're a terrible businessman. What are casinos? They're places where drunk people go to give you money. But I figured out I had to get out. Mm. I had to get out. And I did. Six mm. bankruptcies. Is, I was billions of dollars in debt. Mm. And now I'm only $800 million, So that's not a bad deal. Yeah, you, I've, you're, closed, you're, I've closed the gap. You're making progress. Closed the you're closing made, the gap. Yeah, so I'm not afraid to go to jail. I'm not afraid to go to jail because I'm not going. I'm mm-hmm. not going. How do you, I, this is, uh, and I don't, I don't want this question to sound too personal, mm-hmm. but the way you're able to uh, cultivate your hair style. Isn't it incredible? How, how, do you, how do you? Well, my hair comes down to about here, and then we take the sides and we flip one side over, and then we flip the other side over, and then we flip this back. Because, you know, you... How long does that take? It, oh, it takes a while. I'm the only one who does it. I'm the only one who can do it. So I like to do it myself, and I like to put my cocoa tin on myself, and then I start my day. And it doesn't take long. I'm usually in the office by 11 a.m. I mean, really crystallized the Donald Trump brand. Absolutely, absolutely. You know. I'm up every morning at 5.30. I have breakfast, and I'm back in bed by 6. Someone said you like a lot of uh, fast food. I love fast food. I love fast yeah. food because it's consistent. It's consistent. Uh, I love McDonald's. Yeah. I love cheeseburgers. I love K- Kentucky Fried Chicken, the Colonel. You're from the South. Do you love you love fried chicken. Uh, I'm from Cleveland, but that's close enough. So I love I love I love <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken because it's by a Colonel, by the military. You know I love the military. Yeah. I love the military. Huge fan of the military. The best right. fries on the planet are McDonald's. They are. They really are. I don't know yeah. what I don't know what's in those, but they're really really delicious. Really but that's yeah. pretty much all I eat. That's why I'm in such great shape. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the virus, you know, Mm. I have to ask you about the virus, Mm -hmm. because do you think that if you had told your your followers Mm -hmm. uh, to mask up, Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, mask up will go back to work? Right. That you would have won? Uh, well, I think I could have done a couple of things, but unfortunately, the, the, the virus ruined my economy, greatest economy in the history of economies. Everybody was employed. Everybody had a job. Some people had three and four jobs yeah. right before, yeah. right before the, the whole Kung flu hit. And it's a sad, it's a sad situation. Greatest economy. Everybody was employed. Mm-hmm. I mean, lowest unemployment among African-Americans, lowest unemployment uh, among Latinos. They say Latina. I don't know. When do they add the act? I don't know. When they add but the Latinos, lowest unemployment among little people since the Wizard of Oz. I mean, everybody was working. And then what happened? They, they send the Chinese. They don't like me. So they send the Kung Flu over. And it ruins the economy. But I have to say, I have to say, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty much past it now. We're way past it. But did you notice 
even countries that did mask up, they got sick too. They got sick too. Mm. So I think it's a very pernicious, mm. mean, That's a great word. nasty. I know I try pernicious. to use it as much as I can. Mm. But this, 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 this virus, this, this kung flu, this thing. And uh, you, did you see photos of it? It mm. was, it was very mean looking. Had little things yeah. shooting out of it. I honestly don't think it would matter with the mask. I mean, the only thing you'd use maybe like a full suit mm-hmm. with that, like a full, full suit. Or I mean, maybe take some. If you had everyone take the bleach. You the know, bleach would have been, I, I'd been talking about yeah. this for a while because, or they have a thing called UV, mm-hmm. the UV. Oh, the light, the light. Yeah, the, yeah, it's called ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet, ultraviolet light. light. Yeah. They stick it up inside of you and the ultraviolet light is very violent and it just beats up the Kung Flu and no one would listen to me. Right. No one, I'm saying it says it right on the package, ultra, UV, ultraviolet. And like, that's not what it means. I'm like, that's what it yeah. means. Just stick it up there. It'll fight the Kung Flu. No one would do it. No one would do no it. No one would do it. And then people made jokes about me with the bleach. And I, I didn't say bleach. I said Clorox. I was mm. very specific. I was brand specific. Nope, no one would listen. Mm. But I think we'd be in the same boat no matter what. Because you saw it in London yeah. and uh, Paris. You saw all these places. They did all that stuff. Italy, they did all this. It came back. Yeah. It came back. But now the, you know, uh, uh, they're taking credit for the vaccines, which I... You know, because no one was even using the word vaccine until I said vaccine. I mean, no one said vaccine. Yeah, but before you no before said, you ended your presidency, you, you're hard on New York. Oh well, you're you know what? It's York. not me. I love New York. I, I'm from New York, but Cuomo, that guy, that guy, he plays hardball. Want to play hardball with me? He can play hardball. But you know, you're going to get it ten. T- what did I say? The first question: ten times as ten times as much. When mm-hmm. I when I give it back, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. And also, I don't live in New York anymore, so you know, screw them. Yeah, yeah. What's next? I mean, how, how is history going to, you know, what, what is, what will be said of Donald Trump? They're going to say I'm the greatest president in the history of president. Again, fantastic economy. I place more judges than any mm-hmm. other president. Uh, promises kept. Uh, I made a lot of promises. We got the wall done, uh, at least a portion of it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And we mm-hmm. did, I just did amazing things. I did incredible things. I did more rallies than anybody else. Mm. I did more rallies than any other president. I golfed more than any other president. And I did that at my own property. So I mm. did very well. I mm. did very well as president, I have to tell you. Well, you're going to start your own media network, I Right. Hear. Well, I, I basically am my own media network. You, you know what true. I mean? That's I've got true. the most followers on Twitter and on Facebook. And on MySpace, which a lot of people don't know is still around, but I'm doing very well on MySpace. On MySpace? You still got a MySpace account? I'm killing it on MySpace. Believe me. Believe me. But Twitter seems to be the place everyone goes. But then, you know, months ago, they started off fact-checking me. Really? I'm a president. You don't you fact check a president. Fox. Why did you go after Fox? Because they they're very, they're sad. They're sad. We have some other companies now, and I, you know, uh, you probably know what's happening right now as we speak, but there's a lot of big things going on. I have a, I have a book deal, uh, mm. which is going to be great. And we have a coloring book for kids. That's going to be a huge seller, too. Mm. It's a MAGA coloring book. Oh, oh, you know wow, what I mean? Wow, which wow. is probably the easier. I'm going to probably write that first, get mm. that out, and then get the, get the big book out. Get the big book. There's movies, TV movies. Mm. Lots of things are happening for me. Because you have to remember, more people voted for me for president than any other person in history. Mm. I mean, most of Joe's were, were fake. They were mm. fake. Mm. You know, that was a lot of people going in and clicking multiple times for him in mm-hmm. the booths. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, all my people just voted once. Just one time? One time. One time. 70, 74 million people or 73 million. Well, I, you know, I have a, a, one more question for, or, or a few more. No, I, 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 I can stay all day. I got nothing to do. How did you come up with this whole concept of, of fake news? Well, fake news, well, you know, it's interesting. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you this story. So back in the 80s, when I had my, you know, I was building my brand in New York, I couldn't, I didn't want to have a PR person. Mm. I didn't want to have a PR. I wanted to, but because you can't, you know, you can't control them. So I figured, you know what? I'll be my own PR person. Mm. So I came up with the name of John Barron, who I eventually named my son John Barron, and also John Miller. So anything I would say, the press would just print it. I would say it as John Barron or John Miller in the press, the press. They would just print it wholesale, or I'd send them a press release. They just print, and I'm thinking, well, I know what fake news is. I invented it. I created fake news. So that's how I know the news is corrupt. They're corrupt. They just take anything, you know, I say, and they just 
print it, and it's sad. It's really, really sad. Wow, so you can really create your own narrative, pretty much. Exactly, exactly. Wow. And then when they started thinking for themselves, I thought, I don't like that. And that's, that's really fake news. Mm -hmm. how, how do you really feel about Obama? How do I really feel about him? Well, you know, I think we all know he's a Muslim from another country. But who knows? Maybe he's not. Maybe he's not. You know what I mean? I mean, no one knew this guy. All of a sudden, like, no one knew of him. And all of a sudden, he was a community organizer in Chicago. And then he was president. And, it, like, no one knew him before that. No one knew him. Like, no, like somehow he took all of his classes at Columbia. No one have ever, ever met him. Yeah. And even his professors. Say, what about this guy, Obama? They go, I never saw this guy. I don't know who he is. I don't know how he graduated top of his class at Harvard at law school. No, you don't no think one because he was smart? Or? Well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, some people say that. I mean, I can't. Unfortunately, they won't release my grade from the University of Pennsylvania because my renegade lawyer, Michael Cohen, you know, made them hide all that stuff. But why won't you release your taxes? Oh, because well, what do you, what do you the, have to they're hide? They're so complicated. They're so well, com The average person, it'd be, you know, it's very, very tough. They're beautiful, though. I've seen them. They're gorgeous, gorgeous taxes. They're beautiful taxes. But if we release them, it's going to confuse a lot of people about me. But, you know, a lot of things are out there already that I've done very, very well. I've made a lot of money. Uh, and that's what you do when you're a billionaire. You make lots and lots of money. Yeah. But the taxes are very, this isn't like some guy working at, you know, like, you know, Pizza Hut or something. Mm -hmm. This is very complicated stuff. Well, I have to say, this has been a very, very uh, insightful uh, interview. And, uh, Thank you for swinging by. Absolutely. To, to I'm so happy here. to be here. This is an absolutely beautiful set, and you're doing a great job. And I hope I get to see you in movies and broad... Not that I'm going to go to the broad shows, but I hope I get to see you in something very, very soon. You're so talented. Oh, you know, and I, 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 I just think you're great. And it's, and it's wonderful to be out and about and not hit with very hard, mean questions. I like you because you're nice. Mm. You're nice. You know, so many people are so mean. They're so mean to me, and I've been so good to them. I've been so good to them. But you're, you're a nice guy. He's a nice guy. If you want to be on his show, just call him up, and i will have you on. Well, maybe, maybe you'll come back one of these days. Absolutely. I'll be, I'll be back. I'm going to be around. For, by the way, by the way, I'm going to be around for a long time. Mm. And I'll be around. For, and I'll let you interview me when I'm president again in oh. 2024, which is right around the corner. You're not going to have your sons run? No, 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 no. No, I'm going to do that. And I think Ivanka's going to be my... My, uh, my, I was going to say first lady, but I would have gotten a lot of heat for that. Uh, but get this, get this. everyone gives me a lot of hard time just because I say I want to date my daughter, right? Which one? I, I think that? it's, I think it's a little weird. Yeah, no, 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 no. Stupid rules, stupid mm -hmm. rules. You know what I mean? I'd marry her if I could, but they won't let me. But uh, she could be my, um, my uh, vice president, my vice president, and she'd do an incredible job. Did yeah. you know that the entire time she was my senior advisor at the White House? I never paid her. Did you know that? You didn't pay her? You? Never paid her. Would, Every day would, was bring your daughter to work day. Why would Every you pay day. her? Because she didn't want to get paid. That way she was able to do all that other stuff. Uh, uh. She was able to work on her beauty line and her clothing line mm. and all that other stuff. And, and, of course, we had Jared, who's probably going on to bigger and better things right now. I never heard him talk except at the wedding where he said, I do. And I was very upset about that. Mm. Well, he got up and he actually uh, did a briefing. One time, remember? Oh, that's right. It yeah. was on Fox News. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I never yeah. let him talk again after yeah. that. Never, never again. Well, hey, uh, you know, I hope your golf game continues to uh, to improve with all this time. You I had have eighteen off. holes in one the other day. I had eighteen, 18 holes, holes in one. Eighteen holes in one. They've never seen anything like it. I sunk every <laughs> everything. All the guys are wow. This guy's. <laughs> that even possible? I should have been a pro. That's better, that's I did it. Of course, it's even possible. Do, Tiger doesn't even do that. Well, he's you know he's got a lot of stuff on his mind. He's you know I'm super. I'm a super genius. Super yeah. genius. Stable genius. Super stable genius. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, you know who he is. She has been described as one of the most hauntingly beautiful voices of our time. At the age of two years old, she started singing on the steps of her father's church. And she hasn't stopped singing since. Ladies and gentlemen, the beautiful and talented Tamara Walker. Like grease fries, chicken, like my hands need mittens in the snow. As soon as I got you, I swore I never let you go. I love you like butter melts on toast.
most you're doing the most to me you put your hand in the small of my back oh i love knowing that you know i like that because i love you love you from a place that i can't explain with me 